Wealth management uh, is way more than simply managing money. We work together with estate planners, CPA firms, insurance brokers, and so on, to create a totality that works for the long-term needs of the client. I joined my father's firm in 2006, and we realized together that we could add a lot of value, especially as compared to our peers who didn't have the context or training of a tax advisor. We're in the world of, of data-driven, evidence-driven investing. We are really counter-cyclical educators. When the market's going up incredibly strongly, we keep cautioning people to the fact that these things don't go up in straight lines forever. And when the market's doing poorly, um, we you know, inform them, advise them uh, that markets don't go down forever either. Uh, having the privilege of working with my father brings a lot to the table. We have all of his experience and gray hair, as well as the energy and enthusiasm of the next generation. We view ourselves as kind of the quarterback of a financial planning team. Our primary role is to design and implement a portfolio that's responsive to the total financial situation of each client. Taxes are the largest bills that most of us will pay on an annual basis. And if we can do anything to help minimize or reduce that expense, whether it's inside the portfolio we're managing, or within the client's overall picture, we've achieved a lot. Everybody in our firm really loves what we do. The emails fly at all times of the night, uh, and from early in the morning they start. And you can sense the passion uh, in every meeting, in every client interchange, and in the roundtable conversations that we have with our own group uh, at the office. Proudly having been in business and active through the 2008 collapse, I can tell you that our counsel and approach with our clients does work. We encourage and educate our clients to stay buckled in, to remain committed through the ups and the downs. So uh, RVW has really taken on a life of its own today, um, fulfilling the original idea of low costs, tax efficiency, and no conflicts of interest. It's extremely rewarding when our clients achieve their goals, whether it's a gift to charity or a transfer of wealth to the next generation. That's why we do what we do. So I want to take a little bit of time this morning to, uh, to walk through some of our views on the, uh, on the U.S. economy and the, uh, the capital markets. So I want to start by talking a little bit again about what we're seeing in the current environment today. I then want to move on and talk a little bit about some of the risks that we see uh, on the horizon. And then I want to wrap up by talking about some of the opportunities. Uh, I find that it's always best to end things on a, uh, a high note rather than a, uh, a low note. So, starting by talking about what we see in the, uh, in the U.S. economy today, you know, anytime I think about an economy, whether it be the U.S., Europe, emerging markets, I think of it as having five pillars. And those five pillars are growth, jobs, profits, inflation, and interest rates. And so I think about those five pieces and I come up with a view on each of them. Uh, and then I kind of put that view together to develop a more holistic view about a given economy at a given point in time. So I want to walk through those five pillars of the U.S. economy during our time together today. Uh, I want to start by talking a little bit about what we're seeing in terms of U.S. economic growth. Now, this first chart on the left-hand side, what we're showing here is the year-over-year -year change in real GDP. Uh, that is essentially economic growth excluding the impacts of inflation. The chart on the right-hand side looks at the composition of GDP. In other words, where does the growth tend to come from. And starting with this chart on the left-hand side, you'll see two dotted lines here. The first dotted line extends for the entire chart, while the second dotted line just covers the set of bars over there on the far right-hand side. The dotted line, which extends for the entire chart, represents the average growth rate in the U.S. economy over the past 50 years. And as we show, it's been right around 3%. That second blue dotted line represents the average growth rate in the U.S. economy since June of 2009. In other words, since the financial crisis ended. And as you can see, growth over that period has been much closer to 2%. So the question we ask ourselves is, why might this be the case, right? And is 2% growth really all that bad? Now, economists have this theory. And this theory says that if you take 
growth in your labor force and add it to growth in productivity, you get total economic growth, right? The number of people that you have working, multiply that by the amount of output that each person generates, you get the total value of goods and services, which is the same thing as gross domestic product. So when we think about those two variables in the current environment, you know, starting with productivity growth, uh, while we all have smartphones in our pockets and you know, instant access to all the data that we would ever want, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that that necessarily makes us more productive. I think it makes life easier. I think it makes life more efficient. Uh, but productivity, as measured by economists, hasn't really changed with this development. So a lot of the low-hanging fruit that we got from, from the productivity growth scene in the late 1990s and the early 2000s has really, you know, the low-hanging fruit has been picked. So on the one hand, productivity growth is looking a little bit slower than it has historically. The second thing has to do with demographics. Now, one of the most uh, shocking statistics that I can always think of is the fact that 10,000 people turn 65 every single day in this country, right? 10,000 people turn 65 every single day. So from a demographic standpoint, we're not seeing the growth in the labor force that we did you know, in the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. So both of these variables are dragging on the overall pace of growth or the potential for economic growth uh, that we see in the current environment. And actually, those have brought down our estimate of potential economic growth to around 2%. So in other words, when we see the economy growing at this 2% pace, what we see is an economy which is growing in line with its potential. And you've probably heard some people say this could be one of the longest economic expansions on record. Right? This is a big part of the reason why people say that. We're flying the plane at cruising altitude. We're not generating a whole lot of inflation. And as a result, we believe that this could, in fact, be one of the longest business cycles that we've ever seen. So we think 2% growth is sustainable in the long run. What about 2018? Well, anytime we think about growth in a given year, we always start with this big blue block that we show on the right-hand side. We start thinking about the consumer. Because as we show there, the consumer accounts for 70% of the US economy. Now, I would ask you all a question. What's the most important thing to a consumer? Right, what dictates whether or not somebody goes out and consumes? Right. Whether or not they have a job, right? If they have income. When we look at the labor market today, and we'll touch on this in uh, just a more, we'll touch on this in more detail in just a minute. When we look at the labor market today, you know, we see an unemployment rate down around four percent. We see inflation-adjusted wage growth, which is beginning to rise. We see household formation, which is on the up and up. We see a lot of signals that the consumer is alive and well. So we think a healthy consumer can get us to 2% growth relatively easily, but the risk to our forecast this year is actually tilted to the upside. And the reason that we think growth could be faster than 2% this year, perhaps even closer to 3%, more in line with that historical average, is because areas of the economy like government spending and business spending are coming back online in a way which hasn't really been the case up until this point. So, Government spending, we obviously have a, some fiscal stimulus here in the form of a new tax package. I live in New York, so I feel the state and local deduction pain. I uh, just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page there. Um, but in addition to this fiscal stimulus from government spending, we're also looking for continued growth in investment spending, uh, which is something we've seen play out here over the past couple of quarters, right? A more optimistic business outlook, a better global growth outlook, really. Uh, has driven an uptick in investment spending. And we think that can continue during the coming year, again, leading growth to surprise to the upside, potentially to the tune of around 3%. So in general, from a growth standpoint, things look pretty solid. 2% you know, growth is kind of the cruising altitude. We think we could grow a little bit faster than 2% this year. And we think that that better than 2% growth will really be driven not only by continued health of the consumer, but by a larger contribution from government spending and investment spending as well. So growth looks pretty good, how about the labor market? This next chart, you'll see two lines. The gray line represents the unemployment rate, and the blue line represents wage growth. And if you were to cover up the far left-hand side of this chart and just focus on this relationship from about 1980 to the present, what you see is that there's been a very strong inverse relationship between the unemployment rate in gray and wage growth in light blue. 
And historically, this relationship has been that as the unemployment rate has come down, wage growth has accelerated. And that generally makes sense. <clears throat> unemployment is just a measure of slack in the economy. A lower unemployment rate means less slack, less available workers. And that in turn suggests that existing workers can command higher wages. So we see this relationship play out for the better part of you know, 30 or so years until we get to the most recent instance. And what we see in the current environment is despite the fact that the unemployment rate has come down from a level of 10% back in October of 2009 to a level of 4.1% in December of this year, uh, wage growth has been nowhere to be found. So much like the question of 2% growth versus 3% growth, you know, we ask ourselves, why might this be the case? And we think that there are a couple of things that are holding wage growth in check. The first is the lack of productivity growth. Right? It's really tough to make an argument for paying people more when they're not being more productive. So on the one hand, productivity, or lack of productivity, I should say, uh, is keeping wage growth a bit subdued. The second thing has to do with the decline in union bargaining power. Right? In the 1980s, collective bargaining was an incredibly powerful force. You could raise the wages of entire workforces in aggregate, you know, the, the flip of a button. That's not the way the world works anymore. And so the kind of fall off of unions has also been a contributing factor, in our opinion, to the lackluster wage growth that we've seen over the course of the expansion. And then finally, the third thing has to do with corporate behavior. So I'll use J.P. Morgan as an example. Now let's say J.P. Morgan really likes what I do. They basically have two options. They can either pay me more, hope that I try to cram more meetings into my day, or they can just hire another daily. Right? And the behavior, the business behavior that we've seen has been to just hire another person. And there's a little bit of a feedback loop there because wages remain low, that means labor is cheap. Why wouldn't you just hire more cheap labor to increase your output? You know, it does make sense to a certain extent, but I think that the confluence of these three factors is really what's kept wage growth from accelerating back towards its long-term average. Now, in terms of this year, you know, if the economy does grow by 3%, that's gonna push the unemployment rate down to below 3.5%, to a level not seen since the 1960s. And I think that if wage, I'm sorry, if the unemployment rate hits a level of 3.5% or lower, we will start to see more wage growth. We may not see wage growth accelerate back to its long-term average of 4%, but we can certainly see something along the lines of 3%, uh, which would be far more consistent with where we stand uh, in terms of progress in the labor market. So overall, economic growth looks relatively solid. The labor market continues to tighten. We think that's gonna put some upward pressure on wages uh, over the course of this year. The silver lining, the silver lining to lack of wage growth is that profit growth has remained relatively robust. So this next chart on the left-hand side looks at S&P 500 operating earnings per share. You can see that following the big V-shaped recovery coming out of the financial crisis, we enjoyed a couple of years there where profit growth was pretty solid. Then, around the middle of 2014, uh, two things began to happen, and that's what we show in the two charts on the right-hand side. The dollar began to go on an absolute tear, and oil prices collapsed. So during 2014 and 2015, the dollar was rising at a year-over-year -year pace between 15 and 20 percent. Now the reason that matters is because of what we show in this small white box up here in the top left-hand corner. About 45 percent of S&P 500 revenues come from outside of the U.S. So, so think about this in a slightly different way. You're doing half of your business abroad. The dollar goes up by 20 percent. All the goods and services that you sell outside of the U.S. just got 20% more expensive. You know what foreign buyers do when faced with that situation? Well, switch to a cheaper product, right? And that hits your revenues, and it also hits your earnings. And then the second thing had to do with energy. You know, from 2012 to 2014, the energy sector contributed about $2.50 to overall earnings per share. Uh, at the beginning of 2014, 15, as energy prices were falling, that contribution turned flat. And by the fourth quarter of 2015, the energy sector was actually subtracting $2.50 from overall earnings per share. 
So you went from plus 250 to minus 250, just from what was going on in energy. Now we show some forecasts there over on the bottom chart on the right hand side, those green bars. Uh, we are looking for energy profits to continue to come back. Uh, we're seeing some progress get made, we're seeing investment spending align more closely with the broader macro outlook for supply and demand in that space. Uh, but we don't expect energy to necessarily go back to contributing $2.50 on average the way it did before oil prices got chopped in half. So the way that I think about it is we're looking for some dollar weakness. That should be good for profits. The dollar is going from a headwind to being more of a tailwind. Uh, on the energy front, you know, I think that the pain is likely behind us, uh, but the energy sector isn't necessarily becoming a tailwind. I think the energy sector is going from more of a headwind uh, to almost a no wind, right? It's not gonna hurt, but it's not necessarily gonna help in the way that it once did. So economic growth looks pretty solid. Unemployment continues to fall. Profit growth is relatively robust. And by the way, the reason why profits are so important is because over time, stock prices follow earnings, right? So you need those earnings to be there in order for an investment in equities to make sense. Uh, how about inflation? This next chart, you'll see two lines. The blue line represents headline inflation, and the gray line represents inflation excluding food and energy prices. Before we talk about inflation, I wanna tell you guys a story. So, when I was an undergrad, I went to Williams College in Western Massachusetts, uh, not a very nice place this time of year, so particularly pleased to be out on the West Coast. Uh, I was sitting in Macro 101, and I, 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 full disclosure, I was a middle of the room kind of guy. Right? I probably done some of the reading, not enough reading that I really felt comfortable sitting all the way in the front, but I was worried that sitting in the very back sent the wrong message, right? I was looking for like seven out of 10 participation points, walk out with a B plus and be on to the next class. So there I am, intro to macro 101, 110, whatever it was, and the professor gets up in front of the room and says, can somebody tell me what inflation is? There I am middle of the room, I'm like, this seems like a trick question. I'm gonna let somebody else in. What do you know, there's a person in the front row who's raised their hand and seems to know the answer. So this person in the front row, the professor goes, yes, and he goes, well, it's the average value of a basket of goods, right? He starts defining the consumer price index. And the professor goes, no, stop. I didn't ask you to define CPI. I asked you about inflation. And he went on to explain that fundamentally, inflation is just too much money chasing too few goods. Right, too much money chasing too few goods. So there are really two ways that you end up with an inflation problem. You either see bank lending accelerate aggressively, or you see wages begin to rise. Now, I work for a large financial institution, as does my colleague Matt. Uh, I think we would both agree that bank lending doesn't look set to accelerate aggressively anytime in the near future. Uh, and furthermore, as we just talked about with wages a couple of slides back, you know, wage growth looks set to begin picking up here, but not pick up in a way that I think anybody would deem aggressive. So we have this combination of things going on here where the lack of bank lending and the lack of wage growth will likely keep inflation in check. And I just want to point out over here on the right hand side. So the blue line represents headline inflation. The gray line represents core inflation. You can see how stable core inflation has been over the past few years, right? It hasn't really bounced around the same way that headline inflation has. We expect that with a little bit of wage growth, core inflation will gradually drift higher over the coming year and eventually find itself in line with the Federal Reserve's target of around 2%. So growth is looking relatively solid. Unemployment continues to fall. Profit growth is looking quite healthy. And inflation remains in check. The question then is, what does all of this mean for the Federal Reserve? Now, this next chart looks at the federal funds rate back to 1999. That's just where we've been. If you look over on the far right hand side, you'll see two dotted lines. The blue dotted line represents the Federal Reserve's estimates of where they see the Fed funds rate at the end of the next few years. And then the brown line represents the futures market's estimates of where the market is pricing in rates at the end of the next few years. Now, again, there's clearly 
a difference of opinion here. You've got the Fed, which thinks they're gonna hike somewhere around three times during the coming year, and the market, which is only looking for two hikes. So to me, the gap between those two lines represents the one thing that markets hate more than anything in the world. And what's that? Uncertainty. uncertainty. Exactly. So uncertainty represents a risk, and uncertainty tends to lead to volatility. So our view is that in the current environment, the thing that we need to keep our eyes on is what happens with the Federal Reserve. Because if the Fed goes on and hikes rates more aggressively than what people are pricing in, we could see equities begin to get a little bit choppy. In fact, I think that's what we've been seeing in markets over the past few days. So again, mind this gap between the Fed and the market, as over the course of the coming year, we think that this gap has the potential to generate a decent amount of volatility across risk assets. What are some of the risks on the horizon? What are some of the things that we're keeping an eye on from a risk standpoint? Well, the first is that investors really need to know what they own in their portfolio. And this is actually a fantastic segue from the question about cryptocurrency, right? Cryptocurrency kind of seems to be the hot dot in the current environment. A lot of people don't understand it, and some people who own it basically have no idea what they've gotten themselves into. Um, we think that you need to know what you own, and that you need to own a variety of assets, not only around the world, but across different sectors here in the US as well. So this chart on the left-hand side, uh, there are three bars, and I always this reminds me of a game that I used to play in elementary school called which one of these is different from the others. Now, this first bar represents a breakdown of the global economy, with the US in green and the rest of the world in gray. This second bar represents a breakdown of the global stock and bond markets, again, with the US in green and the rest of the world in gray. This third bar represents the average US investor's portfolio. And the average US investor has 75% of their assets invested here and only 25% of their assets invested abroad. Now that stands in sharp contrast to what we see from a global economy standpoint or a global capital market standpoint, right? 25% of the global economy is the US, 75% is outside. 35% of the global stock and bond markets are in the US, 65% are outside. With that as the backdrop, does it make sense for the average US investor to have 75% of their assets invested here and only 25% of their assets invested abroad? You know, I think the answer to that is no, not really. Look, some home country bias makes perfect sense. You know, we have the deepest and the most liquid capital markets in the world. But to me, this looks like the average US investor is going to the supermarket and shopping in every other aisle, right? They're not taking advantage of the full opportunity set which is available to them, and at the end of the day, doing somewhat of a disservice to themselves and their portfolios. And it actually, it goes one step deeper. So this chart on the right-hand side, these four maps show the sectors that people tend to be overweight or underweight, depending on where they live in the United States. And this is some really fascinating stuff. Let me know if this surprises anybody in the room. People in the Northeast tend to be overweight financials. People in the South tend to be overweight energy. People in the Midwest tend to be overweight industrials, and people out here on the West Coast tend to be overweight tech. What are the big industries in those four parts of the country? Exactly what people tend to be overweight. So this isn't saying that a little bit of bias isn't appropriate. You know, we're all, we, you know, a lot of us have company stock, and that leads us to be overweight in a certain sector. My point more is that you need to know what you own, and you need to understand that if you have all of your eggs in one basket, and for some reason that basket drops, the problem is now you have no more eggs, right? So we need to diversify not only across geographies, but across sectors as well, to help protect our portfolios from too much concentration in a single country, a single sector, or a single asset class. And the second risk, and this is always a risk, is volatility. Now, my general view is that volatility is normal, volatility should be expected, but equity markets are resilient. And I think that this slide does a great job of explaining why exactly that's the case. What we're showing here in red are the peak to trough declines for the S&P 500 each year back to 1980. 
you can see there's a red dot for every single year. Those gray bars represent the calendar year return. So the return that you would have gotten in the S&P 500 if you were invested from January 1st to December 31st in each of those given years. Now, we put the punchline right up in the subtitle. On average, during the past 39 years, the stock market's fallen by about 14% during the course of the year. However, in 29 of those 38 years, the market's then gone on to finish the year in positive territory. So I'm a big baseball fan. I like thinking about this in terms of baseball analogies. If the S&P 500 was a baseball player, it would be batting 750. Right? It'd be the best hitter in Major League history. What this chart, again, shows me is that volatility is normal, volatility should be expected, but equity markets are resilient. And, and last year was a very low volatility year. You can see the largest drawdown in 2017 was a mere 3% versus 14% historically. And a lot of people have begun to ask, well, you know, is this low volatility environment a harbinger of really bad things to come? We can actually look at the historical record for a glimpse at what to expect after periods of low, very, very low volatility, and frankly, it's not all bad. The last time we saw a 3% drawdown was in 1995, and over the next four years, the market went on to generate double-digit returns. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily going to be the case this time, but what I am saying is that we have empirical evidence that low volatility doesn't necessarily lead to big drawdowns in the market, right? It can lead to more volatility than 3%. We see that quite clearly. But it doesn't necessarily mean the returns are on the cusp of falling off a cliff. And as a result, given everything we're seeing from an economic standpoint and a profit standpoint, we remain relatively comfortable staying the course uh, at the current juncture. So what, do, what does that entail? What does staying the course entail? Well, for us, we think it entails a you know, staying balanced and diversified and maintaining an appropriate time horizon. Because what volatility does to a lot of people is it scares them, right? And it scares them out of stocks and bonds and into cash. But as we show in this chart on the left-hand side here, in the current environment, cash is paying you absolutely nothing. And in inflation-adjusted terms, you're actually losing money after taking that inflation into account. So this chart on the left-hand side shows the annual income generated by a $100,000 investment in a six-month CD. And then those blue bars represent the amount of income you would have had to generate to break even, right, to keep pace with inflation. It's been eight years since cash outperformed inflation. For eight years, cash has been paying nothing. And I'm a big believer that when cash pays you nothing, you have to get invested in something. And for most people, that's something, it's not Bitcoin, right? It's not a triple lever S&P 500 ETF. For a lot of people, that something is a simple, balanced, and diversified portfolio. And the reason for that is because balance and diversification create a more comfortable investment experience. And if clients can stay comfortable, then they can stay invested. And if people can stay invested, then they improve the probability that they accomplish their long-term retirement goals. So this chart on the top assumes that you invested $100,000 at the market peak back in 2007. You invested it across three different <coughs> portfolios. A 40-60 stock bond portfolio, which is the dark blue line. A 60-40 stock bond portfolio, which is the light blue line. And an all equity portfolio, which is the green line. Now, all of these portfolios lost money during the financial crisis. The question was really how much. But look at some of these recovery times. Right? That 40-60 portfolio recovered its losses in less than a year. That 60-40 portfolio, it took a little bit longer, but it recovered its losses in about a year and a half. It would have taken that all equity portfolio three full years to recover its losses, three full years. Now, quick show of hands. How many of you could sit underwater in your investment account for three full years without either driving your financial advisor completely insane <laughs> or finally saying, you know what, I can't take this anymore, I'm getting out. Right, probably one of those two things. And the problem is the client who says, I can't take this anymore, I'm getting out, has now committed the quintessential investment mistake. Right, they've bought high, 
and they've sold low. And the return of that investor is represented by this orange bar down here at the bottom. That's the return of the average investor. That's the return of the person who lets emotion be their governing investment philosophy, rather than having a predetermined plan and during periods of volatility sticking to that predetermined plan. You know, over the past 20 years, a simple 60-40 or 40-60 stock bond portfolio would have generated an average annual return of between six and a half and seven percent, but would have done so with considerably less volatility than the S&P 500. So by having a simple plan, you would have way outperformed the average investor. And furthermore, by having that plan, you would have had a more comfortable ride than had you sat in just stocks for that whole 20 year time period. So in conclusion, we think balance and diversification is the recipe for success. This final chart shows the annual returns across a number of different asset classes, along with a balanced portfolio comprised of those different asset classes, which is this gray box connected by the black line. Uh, the two columns over here on the far right-hand side, the column on the far right represents the average volatility in each of these asset classes during this 15-year time period. And the second bar in represents the average return. Now, you can see that this gray box did underperform the S&P 500 during this 15-year period. But importantly, it did so with about two-thirds of the underlying volatility. So you had a more comfortable investment experience. There was a better chance that you could get invested, and then importantly, end up staying invested. And, and it's interesting, because if we were in this room 15 years ago, and I could tell you everything that was going to happen over these 15 years, that list would include a war, this thing called subprime lending, these two firms called Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns, a tsunami in Japan, a Eurozone debt crisis, you know, Bitcoin, so on and so forth. It goes on and on and on. A lot of you would probably look at me and say, David, that sounds like way too much for any portfolio to handle. I'm just going to sit in cash. But importantly, over this 15-year time period, cash was the second worst performing asset class. The only thing that did worse were commodities. So we believe that over the long run, the recipe for investment success continues to be maintaining a balanced and diversified portfolio, and importantly, thinking about that portfolio and its performance over an appropriate time horizon. So with that, I want to thank you all very much for your attention this morning. Um, we have some time left, so I'd be more than happy to take that.